two victims brutally raped, tortured, and murdered. Five convicted after everything is said and done. Join us with the Knoxville Nightmare on the Murder Mafia. Welcome back to the Murder Mafia. My name is Richard Beistrin, the pod father, your host. With me, as always, is my consigliere, my right-hand man, Mr. Dylan Walker. How are you doing this morning, Dylan? Doing very good. Thank you. So today, we're going to record our second episode, The Knoxville Nightmare, the story of uh, Lamericus um, Davidson, the unbelievably brutal ringleader uh, that's involved in the killing of Channing Christian and Christopher Newsom uh, in Knoxville, Tennessee. This is one of the worst crimes I've ever heard of. And there's a lot of angles that played out here. But just to give you guys a little start, five people wound up being convicted for this. Uh, the ringleader, like I said, Lamericus Davidson, uh, Latavius uh, Cobbins, George Thomas, Eric Dwayne Boyd, who was actually not convicted till about 10 years later. We'll get into that later. And a female uh, murderer, Vanessa Coleman. So this story is crazy. I know you haven't read too, too much about this one, Dylan, but give me your initial thoughts before we get into some details. Uh, yeah, the details is what's really crazy about this. I remember when I first read over just kind of the basics of the case, it, it was kind of like a normal murder case. Um, you know, two dead, which, you know, you of course don't want anybody to die at any point unless they do something like this. Um, but once you read into it and you read how bad of a case it is, you really realize, it's, in my opinion, it's one of the worst cases I think I've ever read. Absolutely. And here's the thing. Uh, it involves two people that were carjacked, held for days, raped repeatedly. Both the male and female were raped repeatedly. Eventually, the male whose body was set on fire and shot in the back of the head and left on train tracks. Uh, the female involved in the case, uh, Chan and Christian, 21 years old, um, just just an absolutely ridiculous and obviously ridiculous is a very mild way to put this, but just a case to where you would never expect the brutality and the rage and completely out of the blue. This case also, for those who don't know, changed a lot of laws, and we'll get into that later on also. But the way this all happened is uh, on January 12th, 2007, her family released a statement to the Knoxville community for all their prayers and everything. A candlelight vigil was held on the campus that night. According to reports, Christian and Newsom, um, I'll refer to them basically by their last names, but I'll go back and forth. It's Channon was the female, the 21-year-old. Christopher Newsom, a hometown, I don't want to say hero, but very, very popular kid, played baseball. Just a, a good, good kid. Um, they were kidnapped um, January 7th, 2007, while being carjacked. According to reports, Christian and Newsom had gone on a date. They just went to, they went to dinner on Saturday uh, the sixth, and they were they were going to go to their friend's house for a party that night. Never came home. Uh, during that night out, they were actually carjacked, um, hijacked, bound, and blindfolded by three males. They were taken back to Lamericus Davidson's rented house on Chipman Street in Knoxville. Just to start off, again, there was just an insane amount of brutality in this that we'll be getting into. There, there are normal murders, and obviously no murder is normal, but there is murders, and then there's vicious, violent, cruel, sadistic, completely unnecessary, which, when we get into sentencing, is actually a mitigating factor. They can use that in the court to determine uh, an execution or a life sentence based on the the nature of the crime. So if they can prove that it was more brutal than necessary to cause death, that is what they consider a mitigating factor when they're they're getting involved in sentencing. But so the issue was is that then the next day, I believe it was, or a couple days later, the GPS was located on Channon's forerunner. She had a, a, a brand new forerunner that had um, GPS in there. So it turns out there was originally four people that were indicted for the kidnapping, uh, rapes, and murders. Uh, it turned out to be George Detroit is his nickname. Thomas, 24 years old, faced a total of 46 charges. Uh, he was indicted on 16 counts of felony murder, 
growing out of the rape, robbery, kidnapping, and theft of Christian and Newsom. Two counts of premeditated murder, two counts of especially aggravated robbery, four counts of especially aggravated kidnapping, 20 counts of aggravated rape, and two counts of theft. Latalvis Cobbins, um, born in 1982, so I guess now he'd be, uh, what, 37, 38, uh, faced the same 46 charges as Thomas. He's also been charged with assaulting a correctional officer while he was incarcerating because, you know, he's a big badass uh, now that he's locked up, but he cried on the stand like a little bitch. Uh, Lamericus Davidson, we'll get into more here in a second. He was absolutely the ringleader. He set this whole thing in motion, basically directed everybody to do what they did. Vanessa Coleman, she was only 18 at the time. She was arrested by Lebanon P uh, police in Lebanon, Kentucky. She faced 40 charges in Tennessee. Uh, she was indicted on 12 counts of felony murder growing out of the rape, robbery, kidnapping, and theft of, of Shannon and Christopher. One count of premeditated murder of Christian only because um, they, for the longest time, had a very difficult time proving who did what especially with the male Christopher because they just didn't know what happened because his body was burned and shot, left on a railroad track. So they weren't exactly sure what had happened here. But the reason I said they were arrested in Kentucky is because, again, they ran like cowards. Uh, let's get back to Lamericus Davidson. Well, before we get to him, Eric Boyd, who was originally arrested just on harboring fugitive charges and sentenced to time in federal prison, but he got his comeuppance later on when he had thought he got away with everything. And like I said, we're going to get to Lamericus Davidson, who was the ringleader of this whole absolutely nightmare ordeal. He did face the same 46 charges, um, but he had just, I mean, here we go again, almost like Jesse Dotson. He had just finished serving a five-year sentence for carjacking and aggravated robbery on August 5th, 2006. So, Dylan, I know, again, you're not uber familiar with this like I am, unfortunately, but give me your thoughts on just the amount of charges. Uh, yeah, there's absolutely a lot of charges. Uh, I, everyone got a ton of charges when it came to this case. Of course, uh, Eric Boyd got it, you know, late. Uh, he's already in prison, but the crazy thing about this is I talked about it, I think, in the uh, Dotson case, and I said that you know, upbringing really does take a lot and does can put a spin on your mental state and people do this. And sure enough, Lamarcus or Lamarcus Davidson had a hard upbringing. He moved from, his mom was a crack addict. He moved from house to house, but still doesn't mean he can go murder and rape people. I mean, his sister got the college education and stuff like that. So upbringing really does take a factor in this. And the crazy part about this case is when we're going to get into what happened to the female, the uh, the male, I guess you could argue, got the better end of the stick here. Um, no oh, no, I, I mean, I don't know. No, no, no one got a good. That spot. is a that's a statement that is, I think, would be. I mean, yeah, I, I get what you're saying when we get into the details. I, I get what you're saying. Um, no, let me make this clear. No one got a good part of this. At all. That is the understatement of the year. Absolutely horrific on what happened to these people. It was. And, and not only horrific, there is, like I said, just at times there's things that are completely over the top and unnecessary, and this is definitely one of them. So, like we said, I'm going to get into a little bit of the details here. They, the kids were kidnapped. And I'm going to call them kids because they were 21 and 23. They literally are young enough to be my children. They were kidnapped um, at gunpoint by Lamericus. Because he wanted the vehicle, to be 100% brutally honest. And that's what people like him do. They, you know, he was convicted of the exact same type of crime before. He thought that this was going to be an easy score. I don't know what exactly happened. Obviously, nobody knows what exactly happened. Once he had Shannon and Christopher in his um, grasp, was it out of hate because he didn't have the things that they had. I don't know. Was it jealousy? Was it just pure evil? I don't know what in the world would make people do what this, these group of people, not even just, just him, this whole group of people, they held them for days. Um, like I said, Shannon was con con constantly raped. 
it turned out Christopher was raped also. But not just raped. And again, we're not saying that anything like rape is, there's levels to it. Rape is rape. But they actually violated Shannon with a wooden leg table. The medical examiner during the testimony, and you can see the testimony, we'll be posting some of that at uh, themurdermafia.com. She clearly said that there was so much trauma that you couldn't recognize the area. To have that much trauma because you've been repeatedly raped either with broomsticks or table legs or by a, a man, this level of brutality is unlike almost anything I've ever heard of that's completely random. You don't generally hear about things like this that are random, and I don't this is a case study here that I think people are going to be looking at for a long time. There was a lot of, after the convictions and after the coverage, there was a ton of speculation that a lot of this wasn't covered because they were afraid that this would come across as, as racist because it was five black youths kidnapping two white youths. But this was, you know, I don't know how you could ignore that angle. I don't know that it was a factor but it's very difficult, in my opinion, to ignore that that could have been a factor in this. Right, Dylan? Absolutely. I, I think that Furbridge works some up as a very sporadic murder. He, he's done it before. Um, or he did, the, he did the carjacking before. Went to a carjack and then just ended up raping, torturing, and killing two people. So it was very sporadic in the way that he did it. Here's the sad part about this. Not that the whole thing isn't sad, but there is a very p real possibility. That I don't know if you read the appeal, Dylan, but here's why this was such a big case at the time. There was actually a very real possibility that they could have saved Janet. I don't know if you're aware of this. No, I'm not. What happened was, is when they had the GPS on the vehicle, the police got to the vehicle, they found a piece of mail in the glove box that had a bloody fingerprint on it. It took them two days to run it through the system. If they would have done that immediately, it would have come back to Lamericus Davidson. They would have been able to get to his house like they did when they found Shannon suffocated with wrapped in trash bags, stuffed in a trash can. And she very well might have been alive at the time. This spurred a lot of issues with the police department because there was such a delay. They also actually spurred new laws because during the trial of Lamericus, I believe it was Lamericus, it might have been Latavius. They actually tried to accuse the victims. I don't know if you're aware of this either. They tried to accuse Shannon and Christopher of being drug addicts who they were killed because of a drug deal gone bad. This I am a, aware of this. Yeah, this, I'm sorry? I am aware of this. That actually prompted new laws in the state of Tennessee as far as victim blaming goes because the way it went is obviously it was completely false. But the defense just was throwing darts out there just in hopes of something coming back to where it wasn't, you know, that it would present a different light on their 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 clients, the defendants, and smear the victims who obviously can't defend themselves. Now, this actually caused a huge rift in, during the case to where the father, I believe, of Channon, it might have been of Christopher, but I'm pretty sure it was Channon actually yelled and cussed at the defense attorney for even bringing something like that up because his daughter had been repeatedly raped. Like I said, was murdered the way she was murdered. She was beaten basically almost to death, then placed inside several trash bags after mind you, her body was scrubbed with bleach and bleach was poured down her throat to try and where you would assume to kill any evidence and, you know, including DNA and then stuffed in a trash can. That's how this young lady died. And which is what leads us back to the point of what you were saying. While Christopher's death was also brutal, obviously shot in the back of the head, I believe twice, and then his body set on fire on the train tracks. Again, the medical examiner said that the body was set on fire on post mortem, which means after death, basically because they were trying to, you know, destroy the evidence that would have been there. But that I think leads me to the point of what you were saying before about how they wanted, you know, or how the murder for. Shannon was worse than the murder for Christopher. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, it, it's a brutal, no matter which way you look at it, no one got, you know, a good part of this. It's a brutal, brutal, brutal case. So basically what happened is that, you know, after, a, you know, warrants were issued to search the house, which again, there was whole issues with that too that came out later on. It looks like that the police entered Lamaricus's house, um, or Mr. Davidson. I'm not even going to refer to him by his first name. He doesn't deserve that. They entered at 139. They didn't find anybody. At 142, three minutes later, they found a large, almost like what we you'd have outside for a trash can. You know, big 32 gallon. It's not like a normal house trash can. And fearing in somebody that was inside, he actually pulled his weapon because he thought just maybe somebody was hiding. And unfortunately, the only thing he saw was an arm that was covered with trash. They had actually, after they had put her body, Shannon's body in there, they had covered her with trash and ran because, you know, that's what cowards do. After a couple hours, because obviously now that they know this is a murder scene, um, with Shannon's body still inside, they wrap the whole thing in a a tarp, you know, they have to secure it so they can take it, you know, to, they actually have to have the medical examiner take that out. They can't really just pull a body out because you never know what could be in there that could be what evidence can be destroyed or moved or you know what I'm saying. The actual issue was they were told at three 30, they were called and told they have to get out of the house because there was an issue with this, with the search warrant. They had actually, even though they were already there, they had found everything. They had to actually leave the house because they, apparently there was an issue with the search warrant. The name was cut off when it was sent over. And this was, causing a legal issue to where if they would have kept going with before that sec they now obviously they did issue a second search warrant, but if they wouldn't have issued that second search warrant and kept going, that body, the the body of Channon would have been thrown out and any evidence in the house because they wouldn't have had legal right to be there. That that's the crazy part that could have happened in this case. But luckily it didn't and luckily they found all the evidence to convict all uh all five people of the um of the murders and rapes and tortures of. So what happened next is actually, it just goes along with the whole ridiculous, you know, plot of this whole story. Is they actually ran and were gone for five days. Nobody could find them because apparently they had run to Kentucky. Um, George Thomas, who was Lamericus's half brother, uh, and Latavius Cobbins and his friend Vanessa Coleman, all ran to Kentucky with Mister Davidson. None of them had vehicles or jobs, obviously. They were basically just, they survived on selling drugs. They eventually, you know, were caught. And this is when things started to completely unfold. And again, we'll link some of the testimony to the webpage, themurdermafia.com. But this is where all the details started coming out. And you want to talk about horrific. While Shannon was in the bedroom tied up, or b- literally being raped at the time, uh, Vanessa, who was one of the co-defendants, the female who actually, and this is what always bothers me about cases like this, she actually cut a deal originally with the federal government. Okay, this is key to hear. The federal government to testify, she was making dinner or breakfast for these guys. So here we have a, a young lady, 18 years old, who we're talking about now, the Vanessa the the woman that was convicted, Vanessa Coleman, cooking breakfast for guys that are repeatedly raping and holding a girl hostage in the next room. Now, during testimony, she tried to say, oh, I went in there and checked on her all the time and tried to get her food and, and water, but they wouldn't let me anymore. This is just a brutal, horrific crime to where I don't even know how you can describe it. During testimony also... Uh, Latelvis Cobbins while he was testifying. And this is a, it's not a long clip on YouTube, but you can go there and watch the testimony, the whole clip. Shannon was begging for her life. She knew that, that she was probably going to die and she was begging for her life. She even offered him oral sex to let him go. He let her do that and then just walked away. And when he testified to this during open court, Of course, the waterworks came on and he was all sad. And, oh, my God, I can't believe I did this. And I'm such a bad person. But 
the whole reason there's a bigger issue here, while even though we're going to call America's David said the ringleader, which he was, they had improved, the courts proved that there was many, many times that they could have let them go. They could have let Shannon go. There was many times that Lamericus, who what they believe was torturing and murdering Christopher and and actually raping him, um, they actually believe that there was the, one of the nights that, that Shannon was in the house, there was nobody there but Vanessa and Latalvis that very easily could have let her go. But now all they started thinking about was themselves and, oh, my God, we're going to get in trouble, which is why, again, when Shannon was murdered and stuffed in that garbage bag, they ran, right? Yeah, I, I think this is also, I think it's a, honestly a petty excuse, especially with the 18 year old said about, you know, she tried to get her, I think it's a petty excuse to try to save yourself in that case. What do you mean? I think she was, you know, I think she's trying to make, trying to find any excuse possible to stick to the big four for people to feel bad for. Yeah. Uh, and she has to try to help. Well, ironically enough, she was then tried by the state because they had determined that federal immunity didn't extend to the state. Her case was actually eventually overturned. Um, she was retried and convicted, but she was given a much lesser sentence. She's actually been up for parole several times already. She's been denied, which you would hope she does, but she, she's been up for parole already in the state of Tennessee. Now, while there's been death sentences handed out, and again, we're going to get to some of the, I'm going to say karma here, like with Eric Boyd, he was convicted of federally harboring, excuse me, harboring fugitives because he helped them all get to Kentucky. After everything was said and done, it turned out that there was a lot more evidence against him, and he was, I believe, sentenced to 50 years after this was all said and done. But again, we're looking at it, you know, there is no rhyme or reason to this. It's not like it was a gang killing or if it was a, in the heat of the moment, you caught somebody cheating and it was a you know crime of passion there was absolutely no reason to rhyme to this except for i mean and they very could have easily just carjacked him and left him but which is why there was so much confusion to this case because there was just such an unnatural level of brutality that people just don't understand how this came across which is why i think it led a lot of people to believe that there was a racist angle for not being covered by the national media because there was a lot of belief that if it would have been the opposite, if it would have been five white defendants who had killed two black teenagers or two black victims, that this would have caught a lot more immediate attention, which is kind of sad if you think about it. Absolutely. Um, I, I think to say that any victim, you know, of course, you don't want any victim to have to die like this. You don't want any victim to have to die in any way, but especially like how they died. But it was really confusing on why they would do it because he was already convicted of just carjacking, carjacking and robbery. And so why he took it from just carjacking and robbery to, I mean, brutally torturing, raping, and killing two people is insane. Exactly. And he's actually, obviously, anytime there's death sentences involved, it triggers, uh, there's a lot of mandatory appeals that are required. And it's, it, it literally will go on for probably, I would think, at least 15 to 20 years. He's been in court, I think, three times already and obviously been denied because there's just an absolutely overwhelming just an overwhelming amount of evidence that that proves everything i mean people four people testified against him um his own girlfriend was given some of the articles from channon i don't know if you knew that either no, I didn't know. his girlfriend lamerica's girlfriend who when she came over when channon was being held captive he told he tried to break up with her because obviously he doesn't want her coming in the house was given articles of her clothing that obviously didn't even fit her. And I believe there was a, a piece of jewelry given to her also. But they also found Shannon's driver's license and I believe Newsom's tennis shoes uh, were found. Christopher Newsom's tennis shoes were found either on Lamericus or with him, along, like I said, with Shannon's, um, her driver's license. And again, his bloody fingerprint in their vehicle that they had dumped which again leads me, here's another point too, and I, I just realized it's sitting here. Generally the point from what I understand of carjacking somebody is to take the car and probably sell it or strip it and try and make some money on it. If that is the case, 
which you would think somebody that's being carjacked, that would be the whole point of carjacking somebody is to get their vehicle and sell it or do something with it. Why dump the vehicle? Why not get rid of the vehicle? Which leads us to believe is that maybe maybe they were targeted. Maybe Channon, who knows, Lamericus just wanted to rape somebody or kill somebody or who knows? This is just, there's, again, no rhyme or reason to this. It's one of the most insane, brutal killings, just one of the most insane, brutal stories I've ever heard of. Absolutely. And there's a lot of what ifs in this. Like, what if they would have gone to a different restaurant? And what if they would have gotten there 20 that, minutes? I don't think, well, well, don't for, they, weren't, they weren't kidnapped from the restaurant, though. They were actually kidnapped outside their apartment. What happened oh, okay, was Lamericus was trolling around looking for what his brother said he was looking for something specific. They had actually, now here's why I believe that they were targeted during the testimony that was, it came out that he directed them to drive Lamericus, which is why, again, he's considered the ringleader in this whole thing, directed his brother to drive to this specific area under the guise of they were going to get weed and get a car. So he had already known what target he was looking for. Apparently, because he had actually had them sit there and wait for a while for them to come out. When Shannon and Christopher came out, they grabbed them right outside their apartment when they were leaving to go to the party. So they weren't grabbed from the restaurant. They were actually grabbed right outside their apartment after Lamericus had him, I believe it was George Thomas and Latalvis Cobbins, drive to a specific location of the apartments to where Shannon and Christopher were. I have a feeling, or not have a feeling, but from the testimony, it sounds like they were directed there specifically because that's he had that either vehicle or in my eyes I really believe that he had Shannon targeted. Like he that was who that was who his intended victim was the whole time. Had nothing to do with with the vehicle per se, had more to do with, with Shannon and Christopher specifically. Well I think it's easier to spell that perspective. Uh, I think it's easier to uh, put on that perspective that he was targeting the the victims if not the vehicle, because he took the victims and dumped the vehicle off somewhere. So I think that's the easiest way to look at it, is that he wanted the victims at that point. Well, and that's my whole point, is that it seems to me more and more like the whole reason that there was the kidnapping and the rapes seems to me the carjack was more just a cover-up than it was the actual target. That's why I, I still to this day believe that that Channon was more the target, and Christopher, unfortunately, might have been the byproduct of Lamericus was actually going after. But weird twist on this whole case, too, is that Christopher was actually raped also. That's not something I think that you very rarely see, maybe with some serial killers that have a sexual twist to their their crimes. But very, very rarely do you see just a random murder like this where a male is involved, not only involved, but raped repeatedly. That's that's something that really kind of caught me off guard, too, because it was like, wait a minute, what in the world? How did that happen? Yeah, absolutely. And even some of these sec- with sexual twists, you'll see that they still sometimes only go for females. They, you know, men can sometimes be, quote unquote, collateral damage to what's happened, but they usually still only rape the females. And so to see that that they uh, he was raped as well is absolutely insane. Well, and it then again, we have Vanessa Coleman sitting there making breakfast for them all while Shannon is tied up in another room. I mean, what kind of people do this shit? What kind of yeah, person... Absolutely. What kind of person is going to make... Bre- and she tried to play the whole, oh, I was terrified for my life, they were going to kill me. Here's the problem with that story, and I touched on it earlier. They had left many, many times from the majority of the testimony, to be completely honest. Lamericus wasn't there very often. He didn't stay there very often during this whole couple days while the kids were were there and being tortured and murdered. He was gone a good 60 to 70% of the time. I guess the only time he was really there is during the night. He came there for a few hours, but the majority of the time it was Vanessa... The Talvis, George Thomas. It really, and even George from what the testimony is, and again, you kind of have to take the testimony with a grain of salt because obviously any time in a case like this, people are going to try and save their own asses. And if you listen to Vanessa's testimony, which to me was just a total joke, 
and you listen to Latalvis Cobbins' testimony, it's just it's it's very hard to believe everything because it has a very obvious twist um, that they are trying to save their own skin. And here's the other crazy thing about this. Vanessa, th- this is just wild. Vanessa, a lot of the proof that was used against her was her own journal. Again, I don't know if you're too familiar with this. After the murders, she had written in her journal about what a great time she was having in, in Tennessee because she had just come there. She was from Kentucky. But one of the big issues that, that came about with her journal is her her own words. I mean, you're talking about you're you're talking about a person here and she was given the lightest sentence um because of her help and obviously while she didn't physically rape either one, either of the victims, she was very complicit in the whole situation. It was very here, I'm gonna read you a piece of her her journal. And actually, if you want to see some of the details of this case, please go to Execute Lamericus uh, Davidson on Facebook. And <laughs> the person that runs this has a lot of the evidence up there. It's actually pretty impressive. So this is a direct quote from her journal. Last night was one of a kind. We stayed with a crackhead that is cool as hell. It snowed a little bit, but it's already melted. Let's talk about adventures. I've had one hell of an adventure after being in the big TN. It's a crazy world these days, but I love fun adventures and lessons that I've learned. It's going to be a long, interesting year, haha. The adventure begin being the kidnap, gang rape, and torture of Christopher and Shannon. That's what she was referring to. That's sick. This is what she wrote. Here's the next part. Wake up, exclamation point, and look around, exclamation point. What's really going on? I don't have a clue, or at least I used to be able to say I didn't know. But as much as I've seen and observed and learned, I know exactly what's going on. Although a lot of this is new to me, life's a trip. But it's always amazing how things play in its own role. Life is interesting, full of surprises, very unexpected things uh, that you don't expect with a smiley face. All right. This is this is after the rapes and murders. This is what this woman wrote in her journal. And people tried to say she was innocent or she she wasn't nearly as guilty. <laughs> of the crimes and things as other people were to me this proves that she enjoyed this just as much as the guys absolutely and that, i mean she the way she was writing it at least she seemed to enjoy it a lot you know life's a trip talk about an adventure like that's just what sick people would say like mentally insane people would say when you're talking about in the context it's not like they went to a mountain they were rapey torturing and killing two people Exactly. This is someone who I firmly believed enjoyed being a part of this just as much as the guys who were getting their rocks off in the next room. This is not something that was, this is just brutal. I, I, and I, we, you know, we use that word or I've used that word a lot today, but brutal doesn't really honestly begin to describe just what a piece of shit these people were. And Absolutely. the fact that she was even given immunity from the federal government because of testimony, luckily, I think she thought she was going to get off with, I believe they gave her 10 years or something stupid from the federal government for for helping them. But the fact that she was then convicted of, I believe, initially 50 years, and then it was on appeal, it was overturned, and she was given 35. But she's been, out, she's been up for parole, I think, two or three times, starting in 2014 already. And she's been denied every time. But, you know, then you've got, like I said, Lamericus, who was convicted of, he's got two death sentences. And everybody in this case, in my personal opinion, and obviously I can't speak for Dylan, but I believe should have received the death sentence on this just because of, it's not like you walked up to somebody, ran and put a bullet in their head and they fell down and died. This was an ordeal that went on for days and days and days. And if you can imagine, if you've ever been expecting bad news or waiting for bad news to come, one minute feels like an hour or an eternity. And if you can imagine Shannon, after being beaten and raped and had table legs shoved inside of her, to then be shoved in garbage bags and stuffed in a trash can with your arms bound to die hours later. This She wasn't dead, people. She was not dead. They estimated she was in that trash can for three to five hours 
as many as six hours, depending on what medical expert you go with, suffocating. You want to talk? She about also died with her eyes open. She also what? She also died with her eyes open. With her eyes, exactly. After having bleach scrubbed all over her and poured down her throat to get rid of evidence. If you can imagine the worst way to die, I can't think of anything maybe worse than that. Like my personal fear is drowning. I don't know why. I, I love to swim. I love pools. But to me, that seems like it would just be awful because you would be very cognizant of what's going on. But this young lady who had her whole life ahead of her, I guess from the rumors or not rumors, but the posts on their Facebook pages, they were starting to plan a life together, thinking about having kids, getting married. If you can imagine this, you know, the last few hours of not even just the last few hours, the last few days of her life, but especially the last few hours tied up in a trash bag stubbed in a garbage can with trash then thrown on you to cover you up. That is just, they deserve to die. I'm sorry. All, all five of them, Vanessa Coleman, Latalvis Cobbins, George Thomas, Eric Boyd, Lamericus Davidson deserve to die. I absolutely agree. And even if you don't agree with the death penalty, none of them deserve to walk on for None of them deserve to be free again. You can't, you know, you can't rape, torture, and kill two people who will literally never be able to walk or talk or breathe again. I don't think you should be able to walk and talk and, uh, well, of course you can breathe, but I don't think you should be able to walk and talk and walk free. Uh, now I do believe all, all five of them should be sentenced to death. Of course that'd take like 20 years, but I still do think they should be sentenced to death. But you know but what though? You here's, them. here's the thing on that. Yeah, it might take 20 years, but then, give them the same treatment that they gave to Channon and let them know that they are going to die, that you are going to die by the hand of state of Tennessee because of your own actions. This isn't something random. This wasn't something that was not controllable. This was something you did. And here's your execution date. And in my opinion, with cases like this, with any death penalty case, I firmly believe that you should be put to death the way that you killed the person that you're being put to death for. So wrap their heads in cellophane, let them suffocate, and stuff them in a trash can. Yeah, um, I, I don't know if I necessarily agree with that completely because of that get pretty, uh, that'd, be, that'd get crazy sometimes. But, um, Obviously, that's a little tongue-in-cheek. The state, you know, the government would never allow stuff like that, but can you no, imagine, they never, they never would. do you think it might be a deterrent if somebody thought that what what they did to somebody might actually come back to, to happen to them? Can you think that might Absolutely. I think you're going to see a lot less brutal murders if anyone does murder anybody. You're not going to see anybody getting thrown on a train track, really. Exactly. But I think that's going to bring us to the end of the second episode of the Murder Mafia here with the Knoxville Nightmare. For myself, the Podfather Richard Bison, and my consigliere, Dylan Walker, we'd like to thank you again. If you do enjoy the content, iTunes will be coming up soon. We really, really do appreciate it. Spotify is another one. If you are on iTunes, if you're going to listen to this on iTunes, please give us a five-star rating. Feel free to comment, like, share. That's how we can get more of this stuff out there. If you do have any cases you'd like us to talk about specifically, um, please feel free to, uh, to email me specifically at themurdermafia at outlook.com. And for, like I said, for both of us, stay safe, and we'll talk soon.